If you have a Bible, are you guys ready for the word? Ready Ready for the word? That'll do for now. If you have a Bible, I want you to go to 2 Kings chapter 4. This last Sunday, I preached out of 2 Kings chapter 5. I preached this last Sunday to our entire church and preached out of 2 Kings 5. This This time, I want to take it a chapter backwards and go to 2 Kings chapter 4. We'll begin reading at verse 1. Read verses 1 through 2. It says this, The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha. Elisha is a prophet. We have been looking at him. He keeps making his way into a lot that we do here. This is not intentional, but I do think the spirit of the Lord is saying something. Here's what I think the Lord is saying in this hour. The reason Elisha keeps rearing his head in whether it's what we're singing or it's what we're preaching is because Elisha got a double portion of the spirit that had been on Elijah. I preached a message a few weeks ago when we announced that Beth and I would be transitioning called a a season of transition. And I told you God has a double portion that anytime God begins to take a man, he always leaves the mantle. The mantle fell on this guy named Elisha. Elisha has a double portion anointing. He's stout. The wife of the man of the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha. She says this, your servant, my husband is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? She says this, your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small, small jar of olive oil. I did small and jar together, small, 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 a small jar of olive oil. Oil. Tonight, I want to preach a message I'm simply calling this running on empty. Running on empty. Have you ever felt like you were running on empty? A couple of weeks ago, I felt like I was running on empty on my way back from Lubbock, Texas. Okay, a couple weeks ago, I was, uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm not just a pastor here at Celebration Church. I also have the ridiculous privilege of getting to travel all across the country. My wife, and my, my son, and myself, we get to do it. In fact, tomorrow morning, we are flying to Missouri. I plan on going, I am in misery. Okay, it's, it's a joke. <laughs> But we're flying to Missouri. I'm preaching in Missouri tomorrow night and Sunday morning. Um, But a couple weeks ago, I was preaching in Lubbock, Texas for my good friends, Nathan and Heather Sauce. Okay, love them dearly. And uh, luckily, I didn't have to fly. It's just a drive. So we wake up when it's time to come back, um, and we begin the journey on home. And when I jumped in the car, I noticed um, our gas tank had plenty of gas. Okay, plenty of gas to put around Lubbock but not enough gas to get us all the way back to San Angelo. So I was like, you know what? We just need to get on the road. I've got things I need to do back in San Angelo. We need to get going. And I was like, there'll be a gas station somewhere along the way. I'll stop. So we begin our our journey. Beth, I had all this in, like this conversation was an internal conversation, by the way. Had Beth been able to listen in on this conversation, she would have spoken up. She'd have been like, no, you're not. (laughs) You are filling this car up right now. So I I begin um, the drive on home and all of a sudden, my gas light comes on, and Beth's like, what was that? Like, she heard the ding. And I'm like, oh, we, we need gas. And she's like, you better pull over as soon as possible. This girl is, is made of a whole nother thing. Okay, okay, she, she is on top of me. She is literally, she, she, is, she is honestly the reason that I am able to do what I am able to do. If it were not for Beth, everything would fall apart. Not just in Keenan Clark's world, but in Celebration Church YA. I promise you, anything you love about this place It's Beth Clark, okay? I promise you. And so Beth's like, you're gonna pull over. Amen, she's not here tonight because she's getting us ready to be able to leave tomorrow taking care of our son, uh, sacrificing for the gospel. But we are in the car. She's like, what is that? She's like, you better pull over at the first stop you're able to. I'm like, babe, I know what I'm doing, all right? I have been driving. I have been driving for 12, actually take that back, 13 years. Excuse me, 13 years I have been behind the wheel. So I'm driving and I'm like, you know what? When we get to Colorado City, I'm gonna pull over and find a gas station. So we get to Colorado City and Beth and I are in mid conversation. And I go all the way through Colorado City. I leave Colorado City. I'm about 10 miles outside of Colorado City. And I realized I was supposed to get gas. 
in Colorado City. <laughs> and I did not. And so all of a sudden, you have to understand, I don't really make it out to that neck of the woods like very often. Okay, for those of you who are from around there, I'm sorry, I just don't make it out there very often and uh, for reasons that are obvious if you're from there. And so I'm out there and I begin to pull out my phone and I'm looking at the map and I'm like, oh, there's a city about like literally eight miles away, okay? And I have literally 12 miles left in the gas tank. So I'm like eight miles out, 12 miles in the tank, I'm good, all right? This city is called Silver on my map. I'm like, I ain't never heard of silver, but hi-ho silver, okay? We are going to Silver, Texas to find us a gas station. We get to silver, it's non-existent. There is a house, nothing else in Silver, Texas, and I have five miles left inside of my gas tank. And Beth's like, Keenan, what are you doing? I mean, like, I I'm honestly playing it down right now because I will still want you to see her in a nice light, <laughs> okay? But she let me know she was displeased. I will say that. She let me know in a godly way, but a stern way. I am displeased with what you are doing because our, at the time, seven-month-old son is in the back seat. She's thinking we are gonna be stranded out here and uh, Robert Lee is the closest now city to where we're at. And it's over, I wanna say it was like literally 20 two miles away. It was 22 miles away from where we are. So I go, babe, I'm literally just going to drive in the direction of Robert Lee. Pray. Okay. Pray. So I just start driving on, with five miles left in my tank. Okay. To Robert Lee, which is 22 miles away. All right. And I start driving and I'm just watching. It's like four miles left, three miles left, Two miles left. I'm praying in every tongue I know, okay? I'm literally praying in English. Eventually, I switch over to a more heavenly language, okay? I am praying in every literal language that I know. And I'm praying, and I'm like, Lord, you gotta get us there. You gotta get us there. And all of a sudden, it hits zero, and we are 17 miles out. No word of a lie, just to like let you into the end of the story. We made it to Robert Lee. <laughs> Having driven, driven on empty for 17 miles. I'm here to tell you today, God still does miracles, okay? And I know that, that that's tongue in cheek and we're kind of joking around, but I literally told Beth, I said, babe, you witnessed a literal miracle today. God let us drive on Holy Ghost fumes, okay? I don't know how we got here, all right? But lo and behold, I got there. I'm telling you right now, that was the most stressful 17 miles of my life. I am sitting in our car. Our car is, our car is not, not a bad car. You know what I mean? It's, it's all right. It's Beth's car. I bought it for her. And I'm sitting there. I'm sweating bullets in this car. I'm praying in every language I know. God, just get me to the gas station. How many of you know life gets stressful when you're trying to run on empty? Things that should not be stressful are all of a sudden stressful when you are trying to do life while running on empty. And I'm here to tell you tonight, the woman we found in 2 Kings chapter four is running on empty in a literal way and in every other way. She is running on literal empty. Let me kind of break it down for you what the, the predicament this woman is in. This woman has had her husband killed. He's died of some sort of a cause. I don't know if it was natural causes or if he was, his life was taken from him, but she, he has died and it's it's things a little extra because he was of the company of the prophets so not only was he a man but he was a man of God I thought men of God were never supposed to go through anything I thought men of God never had to walk through tragedy like I thought if you follow Jesus close enough like nothing bad will ever happen to you no one you love will ever be taken prematurely you can think that all you want. And then all of a sudden life happens. This woman's like, my, my husband was of the company of the prophets and he died. Let's make matters worse because the matters get worse. Not only has her husband died, but evidently her husband died in some debt. And now these men called the creditors are coming and knocking on her door, calling her at all hours of the night. Now, I understand that was like hyperbolic. There were no phones back in the Bible days. I'm gonna get emails saying, you're a false teacher, okay? There were no phones in Bible days. It's a joke. 
calling her at all hours of the night, bugging this lady because they want their money. It has gotten to the point where it is now so bad, they are threatening, listen to me, they are threatening to enslave her two boys and they will be in slavery until they work off their father's debt. This is a bad situation. And here's something I pointed out in, on Sunday, but it found its way into this sermon, and I just think the Spirit of God wants this repeated. One generation's complacency is always the next generation's captivity. One generation's inability to be responsible became the place the next generation stumbled. And I'm trying to get this through to you in your young adult years before you even have little ones or they're still young enough that when you fix it, they won't even remember the days it needed fixing. Because if you and I don't take our walk with God seriously, we will pass our dysfunction, pass our debt on to the next generation. When God has called us to go from glory to glory, strength to strength. I honestly think that, I hear language like this used all the time. We just need to get back to the book of Acts. You ever heard people say that? We need to get back to the book of Acts. You know what would happen if Paul was all of a sudden resurrected? Peter was all of a sudden resurrected, and he came in and he heard the church saying, we need to get back to the book of Acts. He'd be like, you're supposed to be further than us. Not trying to get back to where we were. But the sad thing is the church has taken its hand off the wheel, has settled for running on empty for so long. Because we may be empty, but our churches aren't. So we're good. Like people are showing up. I don't know if you can really feel the spirit of God in them, but people are there. And the church has ran on empty for like 1,600 years, 1,800 years. And it's no wonder we're now trying to get back to the book of Acts when the book of Acts should be envious of us. They should be like, man, you guys are walking in a measure of power we never dreamed of because God does things glory to glory, strength to strength, grace to grace. But when one generation doesn't deal with their debt, it becomes the next generation's problem. And this is why I feel, I, I've been called this before. Somebody has told me this before. You have, a, you, have the, you have an anointing to disrupt. Let me disrupt. Let me be the disruptor I'm called to be. It's time that we shake this stuff up. It's time that we get back to where God's called us to be. And we first have to look inwardly. We gotta deal with ourselves. All of a sudden, these creditors are trying to take these boys. Now, here's what I want you to notice about this woman. The only thing, and mom's, in the room, Julie, this may be only you, Julie and Christy. I don't know if we got any more moms. Marcy, in the room. Okay, yes, Taylor. Okay, a few more moms in the place than I realized, my bad. Notice the only thing standing, listen to me. Notice the only thing standing between the creditors and the next generation. It's a praying mother. The only thing standing between the enemy and the next generation is a praying mama. I'm telling you, mamas, pray all the more. I am thankful that I am the byproduct of a praying mama. My mom loves Jesus, and my mom has ple pleaded the blood over me all of my life. And I'm thankful that there were some women who, even though the church has tried to oppress you at times, still pressed in to the things of God and wouldn't settle for their babies not making it to the end. Sometimes the only thing standing in the gap is a praying mom. There's, you're doing something for your little girl, Taylor. You are. You're paving a path. There's a fork in the road and you have chosen the road less traveled and it has made all the difference and it will continue to make all the difference. I seal that right now in the name of Jesus. But all of a sudden, this woman is caught in between, look at, look at this, look at this. Her husband's dead and her boys are about to be taken. You know what she's caught in between? She's caught in between the pain of her past and the fear of her future. You ever been there? Wedged between the pain of your past and the fear of your future? It's easy to run on empty when both directions are looming over you. I look behind me, grief. I look ahead of me, anxiety. 
It's easy to feel like you are running on empty. It's easy to tolerate empty when you feel like you are wedged between the pain of your past and the fear of your future. This is exactly where this woman is. But here's what I want you to notice about this woman. She cried out to Elisha. Now, let me break this down. Elisha is the prophet of God. So in essence, Elisha represents God in this story to a certain degree. He is almost a stand-in, a physical stand-in for the presence of God. The presence of God would come upon a prophet. The word of God would come out of a prophet. It is without a doubt theologically sound to look at Elisha and say he is metaphor, he's a metaphorical stand-in for the presence of God. Notice what she's doing. She's crying out to God. It says she cried out to Elisha. And here's our problem. And here's why you're running on empty. God has become a last resort for you rather than a first response. You will always end up running on empty when God is your last resort rather than your first response. We do everything. And you know what we call it? We call it maturity. We say, you know what? I'm not gonna bother God because a man handles his stuff. God didn't call you to be a man. He called you to be his kid. And there are places where we are supposed to step into manhood and be the men we are called to be, but we don't simultaneously step out of the, being a child of God in order to step into manhood. They are one and the same. And we've got to begin to iron these things out. But God, it's so hard and it's so easy to begin to run on empty when God's your last resort rather than your first response. James chapter four, verse two, I mentioned it a few weeks ago, but it made its way into tonight. James chapter four, verse two says this, you have not because you ask not. It's saying, you know, the culprit for why you have not is you're not asking. Some of you, you are not doing God a, 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 a favor by not asking big things of him. Some of you ask God for the bare minimum. I honestly think, and I don't know, that Ke this is Keenan Clark. Again, I told everybody, keep the meat, spit the bones. All right, keep the meat, spit the bones. That's what adults do. But I honestly think one of the most insulting things you can do to the Lord is ask him for small things. Because ultimately what we do is we ask him to do something a benevolent person could do in their own power. Like if a person was just to actually feel generous, they could fill our need the same way we are asking God to meet our need. I don't know about you, but I want God to show off in my way. No one else could have shown up for me. No one else could have foot the bill. No one else could have plotted the path. No one else could have cleared the brush. No one else could have done what God is doing for me. That's what God wants to do, but we don't allow him. You have not because you ask not. And I felt the Lord sent me here tonight to provoke some people to get a big ask. You need to start asking God for things it honestly makes you uncomfortable to ask God for. And I'm not saying that you ask with a malicious heart. And I'm not saying you ask with sinful motives. I think you should check your motives. I think you should check your heart. But if you have clear motives and a clean heart, you can ask God for the world and he'll give it to you. One of the things I love about our small groups, I get updates about how our small groups are going, by the way, like I hear what's going on. I'm, I'm inquisitive, I ask. One of the things I love about our small groups, I heard it, was that um, a couple weeks ago or maybe this past week, at one point, um, one of the small groups prayed, God, let everyone get saved by midnight tonight or something like that. They were literally like, God, let everyone in San Angelo know you by midnight tonight. I'm like, wow. Like we, and I, I literally was provoked by, the, by that prayer request. I was like, we can ask God for that? I was like, like, that's okay? It's like, yeah, it's okay. I think at that point, we are now tapping in to just how powerful God is. And obviously, San Angelo was not saved by midnight that night, but it's still on us to ask. We've gotta be asking God for things only God can do. She cries out to Elisha. And you know what keeps us from crying out? We think we have a responsibility. It's not bad enough yet. It's my responsibility to handle it right now. It's my responsibility to kind of keep everything moving, kind of keep all the ducks in a row. It's my responsibility. Listen to me. You don't have a responsibility to God. You know what you have? You have a response ability. Break the words apart. You have the ability to respond. 
is what I'm trying to say. We get hung up on I have this responsibility and therefore I'm just not gonna bug God right now because you know he's got a lot of fish to fry. No, he doesn't. God is omnipresent. He is everywhere at all times. And he, you and I have the ability to respond to his nearness. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand is God is waiting with tiptoe anticipation for you to open up your mouth and talk to him. It's not, it's not arrogance to ask God to be God. It's not. In fact, the definition of humility is agreeing with God. So some of you think you're being humble by, by putting yourself down and playing like, oh, I'm not really that called. I'm not really called to do that you know, great of a thing. I'm, I'm just kind of waiting. I'm just, I'm, I'm just gonna barely make it into the other side. That's not humility. That's actually doubt. It's the anti-faith. Humility is agreeing with the Lord. And I feel like some of you, again, it needs to be coupled in this genuine place of humility, but you need to begin to stand up in the totality of who God has called you to be. The world has not been changed by sheepish people. The world has not been changed by people who were okay with with the status quo and okay with the run of the mill. No, the world has been changed who said, we're gonna storm hell with water pistols. That's what we're gonna do. We are gonna storm the gates of hell even if all we have is a water pistol because if God be for us, who can be against us? Are there people who actually believe this stuff or do I need to find another place to preach at tonight? Anybody believe what I'm saying? Okay, am am I in the right place? Okay. It's getting a little quiet. God wants to hear from you. You have not because you ask not. And notice what Elisha says. She says, my boys are about to be taken. All these things are happening. And Elisha says this, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Now, you don't realize the significance of this right here. She said this, let me break it down for you. She said, I don't have a husband. I don't have nothing, and I'm about to not have my sons. I don't have, I don't have, I don't have. And notice what Elisha says. He says, okay, but what do you have? I know there's like a lot of things you don't have, and I've heard all about them. But what do you have? A lot of the times we come to God to fix our problem, and God says, I'm more concerned about your perspective. God, fix my problem. God says, honestly, what's causing the problem? (laughs) is your perspective. I, I need you to look again at what you have. What, what, what do you have? I get it that you don't have a lot of the things you think are necessary for where God's called you, but what do you have? What is under your roof? What is within your reach? What are the things God has entrusted you with? What do you have? I really felt tonight God was going to change some perspectives in here. So many times we think that the greatest miracle is God evaporating our issues. I think sometimes the greatest miracle is God convincing us to look at things differently. Because it's not just God getting us over the problem, but it's God getting us over us. Us choosing to say, God, your vantage point is higher than mine. That's why the Bible says, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than yours. God wants to change your perspective tonight. He says, what do you have? And then she replies with this. She says, your servant has nothing there at all. And notice this, keep the scripture up. It says, your servant has nothing there at all. Then it breaks and says, she said, except a small small jar of olive oil. I honestly think, again, this is Keenan Clark. This is me using my divine sanctified imagination right here, reading into the text, okay? But according to the grammatical layout of this sentence, I honestly think she took a breath right in between those two statements and was tempted to just stop with the first. I honestly think her first statement was, your servant has nothing there at all. And then I think Elisha busted this out. (laughs) You know your mom's giving you that one. How's your room? It's clean. Sorry, you know what I mean? Like you go back in there. It's like that for real. Like you know you ain't telling the truth. You know this is a tall tale. I think all of a sudden she was tempted to stop right there. Your servant has nothing there at all. And Elisha's like. And then she pulls out, except, oh, fine. 
except, we can throw it back up, except a small jar of olive oil. Here's what I want you to see right now. Listen to me. The enemy does not have to steal what you have if he can get you to forget what you have. The enemy doesn't have to steal it if he can get you to forget it. She's like, I ain't got nothing there at all. Elijah's like, for real, girl? Tell the truth, shame the devil. Okay, except a small jar of olive oil. And you and I do this all the time. We can poo-poo this woman and be like, oh my gosh, she's trying to lie to the prophet. We do this all the time. Act like where we're at is not good enough to actually obey God. Act like the things that God has entrusted us with aren't quite enough to actually go the distance. And here's where I really wanna go. If God can't trust you with something small, if God can't trust you with a little, he will not be able to trust you with a lot. And here's where I felt so provoked. I've been asking God to let me talk about this because I really wanna talk about it. And every time the Lord's like, not this week, Keenan, not this week. Love you, slugger, but not this week. I'm like, God, when's the week? God gave me the green light. Are you ready? <laughs> if God can't trust you with a little, he will never trust you with a lot. Here's what I'm trying to say. If God can't trust you to tithe off $10, you won't tithe off 10 million. You won't. If you are stingy with $10, you will be stingy with 10 million. And it, this is a big argument right now of, well, the tithe is not technically New Testament, Kenan. And you know what I do when people bring that out? I love it. I literally love it. When we're talking tithe, like, is the tithe biblical? And they go, well, Kenan, you know, the tithe's not found in the New Testament. Oh, you want to go New Testament. That's how I feel. You know, anybody ever seen white chicks? Like, you want to talk about mother, you know? <laughs> Beth is laughing her head off right now. And I'm like, you want to talk about the New Testament? Like, that's how I feel. I'm like, you want to go there? Okay, let's go there. Because you know what the New Testament model is? It's not 10%. It's everything. Like, we, you want to talk about a model we find in the New Testament? It was that all the people who associated with him, with this thing called the way, people of the way, Christians, they came together as a community, brought all they had to a storehouse, and everyone lived off what everyone brought, and everyone brought everything. You want to talk about a New Testament model? Oh, tithe's not in the New Testament. Oh, okay, well, then bring everything. You, you want to live according to the New Testament. Listen to me. God no longer simply will hold you to 10%. Jesus didn't die for 10% of you. He died for all of you. Jesus doesn't want 10% of your time. Jesus doesn't want 10% of your affection. Jesus doesn't want 10% of your attention. He wants all of it. So the minimum, listen to me, this is what I truly believe. I believe on this side of the cross, the minimum God will ever ask you to be generous with is the tithe, 10%. I honestly think the tithe is for children to teach them how to be generous. You give the first 10. And listen to me, it's the first 10%. The first. Because when you give that first 10%, it blesses the 90 it makes the 90 clean. Robert Morris did an incredible teaching on all this called The Blessed Life. Highly encourage you to check it out. It changed my life forever. Literally changed me. But I'm telling you right now, if God can't trust you with a little, he can't trust you with a lot. I hear people all the time, man, if I won the lottery, first thing I'd do is give money to the church. You know, the first thing I'd do is give money to the church. No, you wouldn't, Bubba. Are you giving now? Well, no, you wouldn't give. God wants to see, can I trust you with a little? And listen to me, I know as a preacher, this can sound self-serving because if you give money to the church, somehow you can think it ends up in my pocket. It doesn't. My salary is set. It doesn't ebb and flow with how much the church gets or is given or anything like that. I'm trying to tell you something as a brother in Christ. This will set you free. And I'm called to pastor you. I'm called to teach you the whole counsel of the word of God. And there's a reason, there's a reason. Everything God gives us is meant to be given back. Think about it, think about it. Listen, let me break this down. God breathed into man the breath of life, right? The very air you breathe, 
is the breath of God. It's the fact that you're living on borrowed breath. But think about this. God breathed into you the breath of life, but what happens if you hold on to it? A couple minutes go by and you pass out. Honestly, worse comes to worse, you die. If you do not exhale, what God has inhaled, if you do not give of what you have received, your life will shrivel, your life will die. That's why Proverbs says the, the, the life of the generous gets larger and larger, but the life of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. This is a biblical principle that no matter who you are, saved or unsaved, will affect your life. And if God can't trust you with a little, he would surely not be able to trust you with a lot. And we are so much like this woman, tempted to overlook it. It ain't, it ain't that much. I, my contribution wouldn't even really matter. It's not going to make a difference in the church budget. It's not about the church budget. It's about your heart. It's about your walk with God. It's about obedience. And that's what God is after. He's after obedience. This is why Zechariah 4.10 says this. Don't despise these small beginnings. For the Lord rejoices to see the work just begin. You and I despair over these small beginnings. Oh, it ain't that big of a deal. God says, I'm stoked you just got started. I'm excited that you just took your first step because I know this one step is going to lead to leaps and bounds later on. God rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. This is straight scripture, but we don't like these parts. We like the John 3, 16s. And we love the Jeremiah 29 11s, but we don't like that. God, don't mess with my money. Mess with everything else, but don't mess with my stuff. God says, I'm here to mess with it all. If God can't trust you with a little, he would never be able to trust you with a lot. She says, all I have is this little jar of oil. And notice what Elisha says. He doesn't go, oh, dang, you're right. That's like pathetic and puny. I can't work with that. Sorry, you know, go find another prophet. Maybe they got a greater power than me. He doesn't do that. He says, okay, we can work with this. And he says this in verse three. Elisha said this, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars, empty jars. Go ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Notice this, she's trying to get a miracle and the man of God says, you can't do it without the people around you. I'm trying to help you tonight. You will never walk in the totality of the plan of God for your life and do it isolated. You need your neighbors. And the man of God says, okay, you want a miracle? It's time to start letting some people in. And I've said this before, but I think it bears witness. I think it bears repeating. A lot of the time, this is what we want. We need healing. We need a touch from God. And we go, okay, God, come over here. Let's get off in the corner. Can anyone see what's going on over here? Am I in, am I in the shot? Hold on. Here, pretend this is a corner. There we go. God, let's get in the corner and God heal me where no one can see. So then I can come out and act like I've been this way all along. That's what we want. We say, God, I need healing. You get honest with God. God, I got the issue. I got a porn problem. I got, I mean, I'm lusting up and down, left and right. Okay, I'm lusting over inanimate objects, God. Please help me. And all of a sudden, we're like, God, help me out over here. And God says, you've got to be willing to let some people in. Let them in. And you know what I love? He says, he says, empty jars. Let them in because I said so, not because you like what's in their jar. Let them in because I told you to, not because you like the contents they've been saving up. They may be in the same predicament as you, but let them in. Let them in. Let them in. And here's our problem. We let all the people into our lives except the ones we actually that actually have something worth borrowing. And that's what I want to ask you. Do you have people in your life who possess something God would ever ask you to borrow? Or are you the biggest and baddest Christian you know? Are you the cream of the crop in your circle? It may be time to get another circle. It may be time to find a new flock. And I'm not saying you abandon people, but I'm saying you add people into your life. The Bible says this, there is safety in a multitude of counselors. A multitude. We settle for like two or three. 
and call it a multitude. I'll tell you right now, if someone ever invited me to preach at their church and they say, Ken, you're going to love preaching at my church. We got a multitude. And I went there and there was two or three people in the audience. I'd be like, bro, you lied. I'll preach, but you lied. This ain't a multitude. Two or three ain't a multitude, but the Bible says there's safety in a literal multitude of counselors. You've got to let wise counsel into your life. I'm telling you this right now. I'm trying to give you some practicals tonight. I'm trying to give you the stuff that's actually going to lead to the vibrant, boisterous life God has called you to live. Safety in Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost-led wisdom. He says you got to let your neighbors in on this thing. You can't get healed alone. So all of a sudden, she begins to go. And he says this. Notice this. I almost skipped this part. He says, don't borrow too few. That's not an actual number, by the way. Don't borrow too few. It's not a number. He is leaving it up to her discretion to know what too few is or too few isn't. I really think this is him testing her faith. What's too few to you? What do you believe God would fill? What do you think God has the capacity to do in your life? I'll let you be the limiting factor. I won't even tell you how many to grab. Don't grab too few. So then the Bible says this. She went to all of her neighbors and she's knocking. Hey, can I borrow some jars? We're in a predicament. Okay, I got one little jar of olive oil. Elisha, the prophet, you know, double portion, told me to go and get some jars. Can I borrow your jars? I'll have them over by midnight. I'll clean them myself, but can I have your jars? So all of a sudden she is gathering these jars. And then the man of God says this in verse four, then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour oil into all the jars and as each is filled put it to one side notice this he says take the jars and when you get the jars take your little vial of oil and pour your oil into all these jars but notice what he told her to do before she does this he says go in your house and shut the door this is important, listen to me. And this right here, glazing over stuff like this is why you end up getting talked out of what God talked you into because you don't follow the instructions to a T. You're like, oh, I wanna get to the, the real big miraculous part. So we go in our house, leave the door wide open and start to pour. And here, l- listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. If the door is still open while you're trying to pour, the door is open to the enemy trying to talk you out of it. And this is why the man of God says, shut the door. Don't do this where the enemy can easily reach you. You've got to first draw a line, a boundary, saying this door is close to you, sir. What I'm trying to tell you is you've got to shut the door on the voice of the devil. Some of you, you tolerate him too much. You let them stick around. You let the naysayers easily into your ear. You let them slither in. You let them hiss all day. Their lies up one side and down the other. And God is saying, sometimes for a season, you need to shut the door. I said it on Sunday, but it, I, think it, I think it bears witness again. Some of you, that bestie you text every day probably needs to become a once a month coffee date. Some of you probably need to create a little bit of space in between toxicity and what God is doing in your life. I'm not saying you write them off. I'm not saying you act all holier than thou. I am saying you guard the holy things. You don't have to act holier than thou to guard the holy things. He says, shut the door. You know, it's crazy. A while back, I was reading this passage here at the church and I was getting ready and I went through my phone and I ended up finding this today. I was like, I think this is still in my phone. I was reading this passage and this literal part of this passage jumped off the page at me. Literally, God was like, shut the door because it's easy part to read right over. And all of a sudden I started getting this Holy Ghost download, like this revelation about shutting the door. And I got really excited. So I started walking around the church and I was going, shut the door. You know what I mean? I'm just kind of like fleshing this little part of my, you know, Bible study out. And I'm walking around. I even think I jumped on the stage and I was preaching like, shut the, no one was even here. And I'm like, shut the door on the, you know, on the devil. And finally I jumped off the stage I don't know if you know this but our offices are up at the front and I was walking back to the offices and as I'm walking up to the offices I pass by the front of our church and this is what I saw and this right here is why you shut the door my friends sorry bud door seems to be shut 
Come on, you got to shut the door on that yellow-bellied liar. I mean, God gave me this little revelation and then sent a snake <laughs> to prove the point. You got to shut the door. I'm telling you right now, you better shut the door before you begin to go out on a limb that God's called you to go out to. And here's the good thing. Listen to me. Here's the good thing. When you know the door is shut and the enemy is out on the other side, he can tell you all day, you look really dumb right now. And you, have no, you know he has no idea what he's talking about. He can't see you. You've shut the door. Come on. It's time to get committed. Some of you know right now God is speaking to your heart what it looks like for you to shut the door. What areas of your life you need to shut the door. Some of you, there's some people on social media you need to unfollow. Some of you, there's some, there, there's some coworkers. You need to go to your superior and ask if you can have a different cubicle so that they don't bother you anymore so that you're not tempted anymore. Some of you, it's starting out as these little flirtatious banterings at a water cooler or in a parking lot, and you need to strategically go get water or go to your car at a different time in order to shut the door on what the devil's trying to slither in. This is what it looks like. It looks like getting downright, downright ruthless with the devil saying, I'm willing to change my schedule. I'm willing to ask my superior to stick me in a different part of the office so that the devil can't slither into my marriage, so that the devil can't slither into my mind, so the devil can't make me his little, his little errand boy anymore. Shut the door. So all of a sudden she shuts the door and I can if I could have somebody come and play behind me, this is where I, I wind the plane down, I promise. All of a sudden she begins to shut the door and she takes the oil, and here's what I want you to notice. Listen, listen. She takes the oil, this little vial of oil. That, that, that's all she has. That's all she has. In the whole world, this is all she owns. She takes the oil, and what I want you to notice is this. It's not like she grabbed it, and all of a sudden, it started to kind of ooze and bubble and all of a sudden it kind of started to rise. And then all of a sudden it started spilling over the edge and God started multiplying it right away. No, listen to me, it stayed the same amount. There was nothing miraculous about it until she poured it. It didn't like start to grow and she's like, oh, it's spilling out the side, let it drip in. You know, like that's not the way this story went. But listen to me, that's what we want. We want God to you know, give us a word. God, I'm, I'm gonna obey you like this. And then we go, okay, God, like I'll pour it out, but let me see a little something first. Like, let's see a little bit of movement. Let's see a little bit of progress. No, she didn't see nothing until she, until, until her faith got in motion. Some of your, this, the Holy Spirit gave me this and I felt it was so strong for somebody. Some of you, you question, God, why am I still here? God, I'm still in this place. God, why am I still right smack dab where I've been for so long? I'm still staring down the barrel of the same thing. I'm still staring down the same devils. I'm still staring down the same appetites I've always had. God, why am I still here? And here's what the Holy Spirit told me. Maybe you're still here because you're too still. Miracles happen when your faith gets in motion. When all of a sudden your faith says, I don't gotta see any bubbling, any oozing, I'm going out on the fact that God called me. I'm going out on the fact that I know he who supplies all of my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus shall provide for me. Some of you are waiting on a literal sign from God when God already gave you a word. It's motion activated. And all of a sudden she began to pour and here's the craziest thing. She poured that oil and it filled one of her borrowed jars to the point where all of a sudden she had to go for another one and it filled that jar until all of a sudden she had to go for another one. And all of a sudden they're bringing jar after jar after jar and this lit, it's crazy. It's, it's like Mary Poppins up in here. This thing is filling these jars over and over and over. Here's what I want you to see. All of a sudden it filled all the jars and she calls for another jar. She tells her son, son, bring me another jar. And her son says this, there are no more jars. And the Bible says this, watch. Then when all the jars were full she, said, full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. It wasn't like, hey, the oil's now stopped. 
and it stopped right when we had our last jar. No, the oil would have kept pouring had she borrowed a few more jars. Here's what I'm trying to get you to see. God will fill only what you bring him. God will fill you, but you have to bring it. Some of you are like, man, I'm running on empty tonight. And I'm thankful you showed up to church, but there are some places, some spaces God longs to fill. God desires to fulfill you, but you have to bring those parts of you. You have to bring the addicted part of you to God. You have to bring the anxious part of you to God. You have to bring the depleted part of you to God. And I'm telling you, when you bring it, he will fill it. He will be faithful time and time again to fill that thing, but he will only fill that which you bring. And if it's not full, it's because you haven't brought it. And here's the, here's, here's the thing. Let me give you a little bit of a cheat code. It will need filled again. Some of you, I have filled this up years ago, and now all of a sudden I'm depleted. You, it, will, it needs filled again. You know what I love about the, the, the book of Acts? You see, in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit falls and they get filled with the Spirit. But then all of a sudden they begin to travel, they begin to minister, and it says they were all filled again. And then a little while later they go into this house and it says, and they were all filled again. I'm here to tell you, there are free refills in the kingdom, but God will only bring that, that will, God will only fill what you bring. And if it's not full, it's because maybe you stopped bringing it. Maybe you stopped laying it at his feet. Maybe you stopped asking people to speak into your life, stopped borrowing from people, or maybe you have completely cut ties with anyone who had anything you could borrow. And God's saying, I will only fill that which you bring. And here's where the story completely wraps up. Verse seven, she said, she came and she told the man of God. And he said this, go sell the oil and Pay your debts and you and your sons can live off the rest. Notice what just happened. The miracle paid not only the debt they owed, but it set them up for life in the future. It didn't just erase the debt. It set them up for life everlasting. You know what this is called? It's called a type and a shadow of the gospel. The miracle, the oil, not only paid for the debt that she owed, this transgenerational debt, this debt that started with somebody who wasn't even them. Can I tell you where your debt started? It started with a man and a woman named Adam and Eve. This is far bigger than you. It's far more insidious than you. It goes back all the way to Genesis chapter 3. And you have a debt, you ha we, humanity had a debt, we could not pay. But the blood of Jesus, he who is our oil, you have to understand, the oil represents anointing. Jesus is the anointed one. I'm telling you right now, this oil is symbolic of Jesus. It not only paid the debt, listen to me, but it set them up for life. You need to understand, when you come to God, he doesn't just erase what you came to him to erase. He sets you up for all that you would ever need. Everything you would ever go through, everything you would ever walk through is now paid in full. And you can come and be filled and filled and filled again. And right now, I feel like there are some people under the sound of my voice who are running on empty when it is completely needless. And if you would bow your heads and close your eyes with me just for a moment of privacy and concentration, I wanna give you a moment to bring what little you have to God. That place that feels empty, that place that feels desolate, that place that feels completely depleted. I wanna give you a moment where you can bring that to the feet of Jesus. And listen to me, I'm telling you right now, He will fill it. If you'd say, Keenan, you're, you're preaching to me tonight. Would you raise your hand? I'm going to pray for you. Would you raise your hand? Some place in your life is feeling empty. Some place in your life is feeling completely void. Mm, thank you, Jesus. Keep your hand raised. Father, I thank you right now by the power of your spirit. God, do what I 
I can't even ask you to do. God, exceed what I'm asking you to do. But God, fill them. Fill them to overflowing. Scripturally, you are not filled until you are overflowing. And Lord, right now, I thank you that every space where the enemy has siphoned off the oil, that's what I hear. The enemy has siphoned your oil. He's come in the middle of the night and he stole it. Some of you look up and you're completely depleted. You have no idea why. You've been doing all the right things. You've been showing up at the right time. You've been, you've been absolutely going after God. And it's, it's that very fact that has caused a target to be placed on your back. And right now I feel like the Lord is saying, I will restore what the enemy has stole. I will restore what the enemy has stole. God, Fill them now in the name of Jesus. Don't leave one area untouched. Don't leave one area void right now in the name of Jesus. I hear the Lord saying he is, he is filling mental health. There's a space and a place where you have been struggling mentally. You've been battling these mental episodes or these, this, this depression, this black cloud that just seems to follow you around. And the Lord is saying, I am filling you. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. He is your shield and your rear guard is what the Bible says. There are some places where you are emotionally empty due to trauma. Some of you sprung a leak from some traumatic thing you went through. Maybe it was as a college student. Maybe it was in high school. Maybe sadly it started with when you were just a child. And there's some place of trauma that the enemy has said, I hope they never find out that this is actually leak. This is the culprit of why their oil keeps leaking. And God is saying, I'm filling, but I'm also restoring what's been broken. My Bible says this, there is a balm in Gilead. That's a, that's a healing ointment. This balm is a healing ointment. God is bringing his healing ointment to the places of you that have been abused. I really feel tonight God is healing someone of abuse. A place of abuse. It was either physical abuse, emotional abuse. It could have even been both. Sexual abuse. Lord, I thank you right now for a healing balm in Gilead tonight in the name of Jesus. Fill them, fill them, fill them. And I also hear this so strong. I don't normally say things like this, but I feel it tonight. The Lord is filling financial voids. I hesitate to say things like that because instantly people want to label you a, a prosperity preacher. I'm not a prosperity preacher, but listen to me. When I am a king's kid, what the king has is mine. I belong to the king. All of his realm, all of his kingdom is at my disposal. And the Lord who owns cattle on a thousand hills and all the oil underneath is filling a financial void. I really feel that. There's somebody who's in a financial pinch. The Lord's bringing a miraculous turnaround. The Lord's bringing a miraculous turnaround. Lord, I thank you for money they didn't earn. Checks they didn't ask for. Venmos they never gave someone their handle to. Lord, I thank you. You turn it around, turn it around. Lord, a tax refund where there should have been having, they should have been having to pay into it. I thank you, Lord. You can manipulate the system to bless your children. I thank you for it now. Filled, filled in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, can we put our hands together tonight for what the Lord's doing? Amen.